Um, fantastic presentation. Thanks very much. I have one question, and that's this. Have we looked? Can have I we ask? I'm terribly to interrupt. Can, uh, I'm terribly sorry. Can, can I ask if you uh, introduce yourself or if you're affiliated with any agency or, or, or not? Or are you no, just a to civilian? Name to well. Totally independent observer. Okay. Uh, my question is this. It is a totally unacceptable and almost intolerable situation in Gaza. But what are the root causes of it? Can we get progress by uh, addressing those, such as why is Israel doing it? Does Israel have room to move out politically, diplomatically, socially, economically? Is it fear? Is it genocide? Is it territorial aggrandizement? Can we, has anyone looked at those with, within the context of the humanitarian efforts? And your question is, uh, can I, what's your name? Uh, Roger Dewar. Okay, and who's that question addressed to? Uh, anyone? E e everyone. Okay. Every, every, everyone okay. on the panel Has here and there. Has anyone looked at why the situation is as bad as it, as it is? Is that the question? Why it is the as bad cause. as it is and what element do we need to address to pull out, to en enable Israel to stop behaving the way it has been doing and is continuing to do? Roshanar, do you want to take that? Well, you ask a very, very, very complex question. Are you and the a lot of people a lot of people have looked at why. And of course there are competing narratives as to why we are where we are. Um, there's a, an Israeli narrative and there's a Palestinian narrative, and there's of course the an international narrative, and I think the narrative that I'm most at ease with uh, is the one set out within uh, inter in the UN context and the UN resolutions, many of those na resolutions are being flouted by the Israeli government. Uh, so, um, and in relation to the more recent issues in, in terms of the blockade and the damage that is doing to people's lives, um, the responsibility ha does lie with the Israeli government in uh, easing those restrictions. But of course, um, the situation with the um, p the political situation is a very complex one within Gaza. Uh, never mind the wider uh, wider political situation. So it's not an easy question to answer, of course, uh, in a very short time. Uh, but what we need to do is, of course, recognise that Israel rightly has concerns about security, but we cannot tolerate. Uh, the kind of action we've seen in areas like Gaza in the name of security, because security, there is a legitimate need for security, uh, but too often what we see is certain actions taking place that is disproportionate, that then damages the lives and the hope for peace. Uh, each time there is so, so an the, intervention. So the why that Roger asked is, is Israel. It's is that, partly, is well, it, it w well, the why is very complex and we need, we'd need to go back 100 years <laughs> to answer the why, but my point is that the why, of course, lies in part in terms of, uh, largely in part in terms of the security concerns uh, of Israel, but the second related point is that uh, that, uh, that need for security then often can lead to disproportionate action. Uh, and the blockade is a good example of that. Uh, the easing of the blockade is an, Im uh, is an important development, but it's not happened fast enough. And that then relates to some of the points that have been made in terms of how it affects people's lives in Gaza and the damage that that does uh, to lack of freedom of movement, not just in Gaza, but across the West Bank. What if uh, someone says the Palestinians uh, bear at least a part of the responsibility for not running their affairs in the best possible way that they could have done? What would you say? W would are they responsible or, or is it all Israel? I'm not saying it's all, all one or the other yes. at all. I, I think that no, it's I'm too I'm simplistic. We have a dire situation. Yeah. I'm terribly sorry to interrupt. We have yeah. a dire situation and then we, we have, you know, Roger was asking, why are we in this situation? Are we only because, it's, is it black and white? Is no, it one party? Not. So the Palestinians bear, do they, what do you think, Roger? Do they bear a part of the responsibility for how bad the situation is? <laughs> I'm not a diplomat, I, I, I'm not a politician. I, I, I simply don't know, I'm trying to find out. 
Uh, my suspicion is that Israel is certainly overreacting in this case. It is possibly using Gaza as a shield to protect itself from Iran and Syria and the other uh, states in the area who would rather Israel wasn't there. Um, I would like to think I'm wrong in that, but I'm uninformed and, and I'm really trying to, to see if I can get any, any information to change my mind on that here. Mm. Thank you. Massive question. Okay, anybody else? Um, I'm Mara James. I'm a master's student at King's College and a researcher with Unitas Communications. And my question is for the whole panel, but uh, especially those in the field. I have a professor at King's who believes that the Third Intifada has started in the Palestinian territories, more specifically in the West Bank. Um, so I was wondering, what are your thoughts on that? How do you think um, that will affect Gaza and people on the ground in Gaza and the blockade? And what's, what's the future there? there? There is definitely increased tension, I increased clashes. Who would you like, you said you wanted to ask someone who's in the field. Well, yeah, uh, so basically my professor believes this from reports so coming out of the West Bank. And so who, who would you like, is that to anyone And in anyone particular? in the field who okay. works with Gazans on a daily basis, okay. like do they also believe that there's increased mm. tension? How about? And how would that affect? How about Ahmed Abu Tawahina? Yeah. Okay, Ahmed, do you feel, do you see signs that a third intifada is on, uh, is on the way? The, the intifada is ongoing, actually. But the, the, the signs and symptoms of the intifada have been uh, developed, in a way. In the West Bank, there are some clashes now uh, in order to express the, the, the deep feeling of hopelessness and powerlessness. Uh, among uh, the Palestinians, especially after uh, the evidence of uh, uh, one of the Palestinian prisoners had been killed at the hands of Israeli torture. The, the Israelis and deny that. The, the Israelis say that he died of a heart attack. Just, no, just the Israelis deny the, the, the question of occupying Palestine in, in, in general. They denied the right uh, of Palestinians to return to their homeland. They denied the right of Palestinians to be a human being. Okay. Nowadays, but, uh, back to the Intifada question. Uh, you yes. know, when I think when the, you were asking about the Intifada, we know what the Intifada is. We know uh, an Intifada in the form that we've seen in two, uh, 2010. Uh, sorry, the the second Intifada and the first Intifada. Th that's the form of intifada that the question is about, not the ongoing struggle. Do you see a third intifada coming? Yes, it's possible. It, 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 you know, uh, all what's going on in the West Bank indicates that a third intifada is already begun. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? For, for Gaza, is no, that a good what thing? Do you, Gaza what, 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 do you expect, what do you expect of those who are put in the corner and being humiliated all the time? No, I, I, the question is not if it's inevitable or not. Is it a good thing, you think, or a bad thing for Gaza? That was the question. This it would be resulted in more negative aspects, like the first and second intifada. Yeah. Right. That would be used and executed by the Israelis, and this would be considered the threat for their uh, eluded security and safety. Right. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Go. Come on in the back first. Hi, my name is Sophia, and I'm a master's student at the LSC. Um, my question is in relation to UNRWA. Um, you know, their mandate is currently, well, it's continually being renewed, and I'm wondering. When does their mandate end, and what is going to happen when this mandate ends? Okay. Robert Turner, did you hear the question? Sorry, Sam, it was broken. Could you repeat, please? Uh, yes. When does the UNRWA mandate end? Does it end? Uh, I hope it ends. Um, I, I often say here I, I would like to be the last director of UNRWA Gaza, but it seems unlikely because the mandate of UNRWA is unlikely to end until there is a resolution of the refugee question uh, as part of the final status negotiation. So 
Um, the mandate has been consistently renewed by the General Assembly, and my assumption would be that that would continue to be the case, as I say, until there is an agreement on uh, on the refugees. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we've got some something you want to say. Uh, we've got some questions on Twitter. Uh, let me read this from Naim Kerawala, project consultant at Jawani Mahrata Chamber of Commerce, Industries and Agriculture. Question is, would the UN or the international community take any action against Israel if it continues with the settlement's expansion? Uh, it doesn't say who that's addressed to. Let me address it to you, Rehwana. Do, do, do you think sure. <coughs> uh, the UN or the international community, of which the UK is a proud member, should take any action? Well, sa sadly, there hasn't been very much action. Settlement activity has increased over the years mm. and is continuing. And although there have been statements uh, by various governments uh, highlighting their unhappiness about the expansion of settlements, uh, not a great deal more has happened. So. Uh, and, and that is a serious issue, particularly in terms of what it's doing to people's everyday lives in the West Bank. Uh, so President Obama's original uh, remarks about settlement activity uh, were, were highlighting the, these kinds of, the, 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 the consequence but of settlement activity, but the international community hasn't uh, the UK applied has. the right kind of pressure uh, to get a stop <coughs> to the settlement activity. But the UK has expressed its displeasure with, with the, uh, so is that, is that pressure, does that qualify as pressure? Well, if the expression of displeasure, which is of course to be welcome, uh, stops the settlement activity, then that would be a helpful uh, outcome. But, uh, but sadly, that's not what's happened. And I think this is again <coughs> where there is a great deal of um, <coughs> unhappiness, and rightly so, uh, for those who feel that there are double standards when it concerns the uh, situation in Gaza or the West Bank, that the actions of the Israeli government, particularly in issue on issues like uh, settlements, are not condemned strongly enough by the international community. When they flout UN resolutions, uh, there are not adequate uh, checks and um, uh, ways of keeping pressure on the Israeli government to uh, abide by uh, international mm. law and UN resolutions. And that's what creates a sense that the international community is uh, not being even-handed. And it's very important that that, is that lack of trust and faith is restored at the moment that doesn't exist. So what, what would Labour do then? Well, I, well we, we uh, have uh, we've made it very clear uh, our objection to the settlements and the continued uh, expansion of settlements, which is causing fragmentation but of what, the what Palestinian would Labour do if it uh, was in power? Uh, well, well I, it goes back to the uh, role of not just br the British government. If we were in government, we would apply pressure and work with our European allies to make sure that there is a strong voice at, from the European uh, angle um, uh, working with the Americans and other members of the international community and UN Se Security Council members to apply the maximum uh, and appropriate pressure on the Isra Israeli authorities to return back to the negotiation tables so that we can actually get to a point where it could be, because essentially the last few years, uh, very little um, action, uh, uh, there has been very little action to return to negotiation, which is absolutely vital. Okay. Uh, I think s there was a question, question here. I'm trying to remember the order of hands raised. Uh, yeah, you yeah, might as well. I mean, it's a microphone's there. You might as well. Thank you. Uh, my name is Zala Tertir, and I'm a PhD candidate at London School of Economics and the program director of Al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network. Um, Thank you for the report, which is really great and great study. However, um, uh, and it's excellent panel, I will tell you why. But overall, I'm, I'm a, an optimistic person. However, um, uh, I don't be really very optimistic when I hear a politician from the opposition uh, argue for uh, easing restrictions but not lifting blockade. 
and there is a massive difference between easing restriction and lifting lifting blockade. And I don't want to hear what uh, what the govern the official government will say in that opinion. But m maybe also it is worth mentioning that um, the uh, Tony Blair and the Labour were in, in power, and we also we know them and what they did, and we know what is Tony Blair doing now in the Palestinian territories, which is absolutely nothing zero. Um, however, also if I um, if I may, if I may, some s if I may say something else, uh, you stressed um, on the negotiations, and that is at that is the uh, magical solution. Mm -hmm. But I think th over 20 years we know what negotiations uh, reach us to where, and I think now we need to address the root of the problem, which is not negotiation, but rather ending the occupation. These were just two quick comments. But my my question, if I may, to Mr. Uh, Turner. Uh, I know it is crazy to ask such question hearing all of this pessimistic view and hearing all the facts on the ground. But what do you think about the idea that Hamas urged the people who, lef who, who left Gaza, uh, particularly in 1967, to come back to exercise the right of return? Because as you know, what matters for Palestinians is the right of return and the exercise of right of return. And then uh, UNRWA will shut down their offices and then than a Palestinian exercise the return. What do you think uh, of such an idea? I'm, I'm sorry, Sam. We, we can't hear the people with the microphone very clearly. You'll have to repeat that. Alat was asking that the idea that Hamas asked um, people to return to Gaza, the expats, to return to Gaza and to invest and, you know, no, no, to no. That, uh, that, uh, no. Um, the idea is that since Hamas sort of have uh, that has a de facto authority and they control the borders, so why not to start as Palestinians? Why not to start exercising the right of return, which is which is uh, a right that they need okay. to practice? So, what do you think that? the few thousands will come back and practice their right of return as refugees, mainly the one who left after 1967. What do you think that would achieve? Where would that is lead? It possible if, if they all return? Is it, is it possible? Like Did you hear that, Robert? No. Okay. Uh, if thousands of Palestinians returned to Gaza tomorrow, yes. what would that achieve? What do you think of that? And what would it achieve? What would it lead to? 1967 mm -hmm. refugees the, from the Gaza. If, if all the refugees returned, exercised their right of return. To Gaza? There are not refugees from Gaza. There are very, very few. No, 1967 is one. Yeah. Th well, there is no statistics about them, so I'm not sure how big, but uh, there were some calls that say that. Would it be fair to say if they returned to, to the Palestinian territories? No, yeah, mainly in, to in Gaza because this uh, Hamas can do that because they cannot return to the West Bank because Israel will not allow them. But now through Rafah crossing, they can return. Okay. Would that be a good thing for Gaza if thousands of Palestinians returned? Robert? Yeah, I'm, I'm unaware of a significant caseload of refugees from Gaza. I mean, there is a diaspora of Palestinians some from West Bank, some from Gaza, some from other places. Um, but I'm unfamiliar with a, a Gazan refugee caseload. Okay. But if that scenario did take place, would that be good? Are, are you suggesting that this is a good thing, yeah? Well, I'm aware of that there is no space for these people in, in one way or another, but okay. this, is, this is the Israeli argument. But uh, what I'm aware of is that this is a right and the Palestinians should practice. So uh, what so matters you, for me is that You're calling on expats to return and see what happens. Well, not expats, like the people who... Yeah, who's yeah. Origin yeah. yeah. Uh, you know what I mean. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. You think that's a good thing? That, that would shake, stir things up? Well, as part... Would it be good for Gazans, for the economy? Well, that's what we don't know, you know, mm. like, and this is why I asked the There question. was a brief like lull when uh, there was a lot of investments and lots of five-star hotels were rising up in Gaza. Mm -hmm. uh, where did that lead? Well, destruction, no? I mean, yeah. we saw what Oslo brought us, and we saw yeah, that Oslo brought much. us a big bubble. And this is what is happening now in, yeah. in, in the West Bank, but happened previously in, in Gaza. Yeah. And, and we obviously saw where the negotiation route lead us. And this is, this is what Oslo and that framework lead us to. And this is, unfortunately, as international community, are responsible about the Palestinians in Gaza and West Bank because they brought this Oslo framework. Now we're, uh, unfortunately, we're stuck 
to the negotiations and the two-state solutions and all of that. And the facts on the ground tell us that this is really not viable. So I'm wondering why we still... Okay. Can I, can I just come yeah. back on but the... But I'm also very aware that it's uh, almost impossible to separate the, yeah. the, the humanitarian yeah. aspect yeah. of this discussion from the <laughs> politics. Yeah. Yeah. But let's try okay. as much as possible yeah. to bring it back to the plight the humanitarian. of the humanitarian. Issues. Well, I, d I just wanted to... Is it Sab Sabah? Sorry, your Allah, name? Allah. Allah. Allah, apologies, apologies, Allah. Um, I just wanted to just clarify my point about the blockade. Um, uh, uh, I certainly wasn't referring to easing restriction being good enough. It's certainly not, and we need to see the end of it. Um, the your point about the 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 negotiations. Um, I, I completely agree with you that it's been inadequate to say the least. Um, the question is, and we were all agreed, uh, I would hope that, uh, and, and I would expect that everyone, most people want to see the end of the occupation. The question is, how do you get there? And I'm very interested to know how you think we can get there. Because, uh, you know, it goes back to um, what your vi avenues are for trying to achieve the end you're seeking. So I, I would throw that question back to you. If there is no room, if you're saying there is no place for political leaders uh, or negotiation, I understand the frustration. Uh, I mean, I, I represent a constituency of a sizable population that feel very strongly uh, about the fact that we have had uh, failure after failure in, in relation to this conflict. Um, so, you know, the sense of frustration is, of course, great and grave within the region but as much in, in the rest of the world. Um, so the question is, how do you end it? And wh what are the vehicles? And I, I think this is something that we should be discussing and getting feedback from you. What are your ideas about how that can happen, mm. given the failure of the international community and politi can political I, failure? Can I suggest that we, we answer this question and carry mm. on this conversation sure. online to allow as many people uh, as possible to ask questions, uh, or afterwards, between you and mm -hmm. Allah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So. We have, while the microphone is on its way, I'd like to uh, read this from uh, Nuha Bashir, who's a consultant for USAID based in the Gaza Strip. Donors are very generous with Palestine. However, she says, their donations might not be tailored to the nature of the conflict. How do you respond to that? That's a question for Sarah Adamsik to think about while we hear your question. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I just, I'm getting confused all with the <laughs> order of <laughs> hands raised. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm Sarah Pantulian. I'm the head of the humanitarian policy group here at ODI. Um, there is something that the report um, tackles but has not really been discussed by the panel and is the impact that counter-terror um, legislation, particularly the U.S. Statute for Material Support, has on uh, humanitarian organizations. Um, that Basically, of course, Hamas is a listed entity, and it means that you know there is the danger that humanitarian organisations engaging with Hamas can be criminalised mm. um, because material mm. support can, you know, is sustained engagement can be construed as yeah. material support. Um, and I'd like to ask Sarah in particular, but also Robert. I mean, this doesn't apply to UNRWA, but mm. be really useful to hear, you know, what this means concretely in terms of, um, you know, implementing programs where engagement with the authority on the ground is essential, and yet humanitarian organisations are constrained in the possibility of engaging with the authority because of the risk it exposes them for criminalisation. Okay, mm. and I think that sort of relates to uh, Nuha Bashir's question about yeah. the, the the aid is not necessarily tailored. Sarah, I hope you've heard both questions um i heard so i definitely heard the first one the second one was about uh engagement with, with the authorities is that correct yeah how yeah but with the counter-terrorism legislation how can you know aid aid agencies are restricted in what they can collect donations for and how they send them and in what form to the Gaza Strip. Uh, how they engage with Hamas is the least identity in because implementing Because it's labeled it. as a terrorist organization by the United States. And Noha Bashir's uh, uh, question is, is n not very dissimilar. Uh, donors are generous, so there is money with Palestine. However, their donations might not be tailored to the nature of the conflict. How do you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, I guess um, I was hoping to get more context on how it wasn't tailored. I think one of the areas we struggle in Gaza 
is it really is on this cusp of often humanitarian and development work. Um, because something, you know, for example, last November happens and we're, it's very much a humanitarian emergency response back to that. But then the blockade has created, and because it's so aid dependent, it's basically at subsistence level. So it's not, you know, it's not a humanitarian response that you, in Syria or elsewhere like that emergency response. We're dealing with a long-term protracted conflict and it is very much um, kind of crossover with development work at, at points. I don't know if that's what the first question was asking in relation to um, whether or not it's tailored. Um, the second question about, uh, you know, whether tailored the, the role of counterterrorism le legislation and engagement with authorities is, is something that every, um, I mean, all UN agencies, INGOs struggle with in Gaza um, because it is a difficult, especially as work becomes more you know, more development where you would, t in any other context, work with the government, you're very constrained in doing that um, in Gaza. And I, you know, it is something, you know, that it's at this level, it's, you know, we're at the INGO level and UN level trying to implement programs. It's something, you know, coming down from donors and then the, their governments as well. And it's, it's certainly not just U.S., um, U.K. and E.U. Um, both classify Hamas as a terrorist organization as well, or at least Al-Qassam briga brigades. So it is, um, it's, it's very much um, often a balance and just trying, trying to implement as much as we can um, without, without actually engaging. I'm, I'm not sure I understand. How do you do yeah. it without engaging? <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's be honest. Um, How do you yeah, deliver no. the aid without engaging with Hamas? So, for example, I mean, um, we work quite a bit with UNRWA with our um, legal aid program. You know, so we're we are not the lawyers who work for NRC are not working in the courts. Um, we, you know, very much clear uh, red lines. We, you know, cannot, you know, anything. We cannot fund anything related to the mm -hmm. government. But we're working through, and especially through with the legal organization here, trying to do as much as we can with the, PB, with the Palestinian Bar Association, with law students, um, with more building, focusing on civil society, other non-state actors. Um, so it is a bit um, circular, you know, in some ways, where, mm. but it is, I think organizations are, are finding means in that way. It's, it's, not, it's not easy. Um, if, if I can yeah. come in as well, I, mean, I think there's also just a huge amount of uncertainty and confusion about what the legislation means. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard even for people to talk to each other because a lot of people operate um, on a don't ask, don't tell basis with mm -hmm. some of their donors. And um, it also depends on, on how the organization is constituted, where they get their funding from, who they're staffed by. Uh, getting getting clarity on that in our report was difficult. I mean, we had one agency complain that we'd said that they were subject to X or Y constriction, a restriction, and they said that's not true. And our response was, but someone else in your organization <laughs> told us that that was the restriction that we were under. And that, that was something that, w there wasn't even uniform understanding of how applicable they were within one organization, let alone across <laughs> the, the development and, and humanitarian community. Um, and then just also to emphasize that it's, I think there's also um, there's there's a there's a, a conversation that maybe needs to be had about reconstruction in Gaza when you're talking about if you if you put an urban frame on it, on making uh, interventions into rebuilding housing into um, <coughs> if it were even possible if uh, you know given the, the, the restrictions on on importing um, construction materials to address the much larger housing backlog. Um, on how you do that kind of planning, which has to happen at a national level, that has to happen on long term without speaking to people who are really central in the government, um, because there 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 aren't restrictions on on speaking to lower level Hamas um, functionaries. But it's once you get higher up the the chain of command, it becomes more complicated. Mm. Mm. Hi, uh, my name is Zina Ayman, and I'm a journalist who uh, has been on the ground in Egypt for the past two years, reporting on the uprising. And you had mentioned that after the election in Egypt, there was a sense of optimism on the ground. Um, how do you think, um, I mean, I, you haven't been there since, but if the people who are currently on the ground, if they could speak to what the sentiment is now, and in a broader sense, the continued tumults in the region, how has that affected the, the resistance movement in Gaza and the sense of this, you know, the 
approach of a third intifada. How that, the, the tension on the ground, how yeah. it affected aid and distribution of aid? and No, 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 the, the, how it's affected the mentality of resistance and continued efforts to, to build on the intifada in, on the ground. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm really not uh, well placed to answer that question. For, for the, the folks in, in Gaza, it was about, uh, it was in reference to saying that there was optimism after the Egyptian election about what that would mean in Gaza. Um, so probably people who are based there now would be able to say if mm. that optimism is, is still there. Um, and also the, the, the question was about whether the Arab Spring had also affected the mood in Gaza um, more broadly. Mm. Should we, should we ask uh, very briefly, uh, Ahmed, how, how the mood was affected, is affected, by uh, the Arab Spring? You know, Gaza in particular, and uh, occupied Palestinian territories in general, uh, having a great hope of the new movements within the Arab was, especially the ones in Egypt. But after having Egyptians stuck in their spring, if we allow ourselves to call it spring, uh, hopes have been demolished uh, in a significant way. So the, the, the only thing uh, uh, that Palestinians should do is to keep resisting the Israeli occupation, because this is the main nightmare in our life as Palestinians. The third intifada is already planned by the current Israeli government because Netanyahu has an agenda. He is trying to receive Obama in his next visit with a new agenda. That's why he's planning for this third intifada. Okay. Let's try, try and to bring you back very quickly. I have a question from uh, online from Farida, independent researcher. And I think that's for you, Robert. Uh, Farida is saying online, I was wondering if... Uh, you've come across returning Palestinian refugees who have been displaced by the conflict in Syria and apparently have gone back to Gaza. I was wondering, she says, what their status is. Have they registered with UNRWA? Are they recipients of aid? And what are their entitlements now? There have been a small number of uh, Gazans who were in Syria have come to uh, to so I've returned to Gaza from Syria. Uh, I, I believe the number is about 300. Um, they are eligible for all regular UNRWA assistance. They're attending the schools. They're going to the health clinics. And we're discussing with the Syria operation what additional kinds of support we'll be able to offer them. OK, but no, no great numbers. No. It's just, frankly, too difficult to get from Syria to Gaza. Exactly. Exactly. Might go through Lebanon. Um, one. But let's, this lady, she's been waiting. What happens in one place uh, in this uh, globe is affected by what happens in all the other places, the rest of the world. Um, we need to re increase the constituency of rejecting wrongdoing. We need to increase the constituency of uh, increasing uh, the good thing and the right thing. Um, so uh, Israel is not uh, um, condemned enough, not uh, challenged enough. So if uh, wrongdoing is not challenged enough in the rest of the world, in so many parts, um, this is uh, the pressure on Sri I mean, <laughs> Israel is not enough, not at mm -hmm. all enough. These people are just humiliated. So this you'd, is you'd like unacceptable. So you'd like to see yeah, more, more the pressure? The, the whole world, the international community, must realize that they have to uh, reject wrongdoing okay. and uh, increase the consistency of the right thing. Sure. Yeah. OK, thanks very much. Uh, Joe? <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Joe from Open Democracy. Might I borrow one of your microphones as this is a yes. gift to... Yes. Do you want to take mine? In Gaza. Why not? I'll give it back. I promise. Go on then. <laughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> we, we've been hearing um, how 
uh, the situation in the West Bank differs to that in Gaza, and I think the, the points that were raised about counter-terrorism legislation and the way in which humanitarian practice can interact with any kind of, of official de facto uh, governance structure um, is, is very important. I wanted to return briefly um, to what Simon raised earlier and towards the end of, of, your, of your presentations about the possibility for Fatah and Hamas to find some common ground around implementation, around um, uh, humanitarian uh, <laughs> resilience, shall we say, um, looking forward, uh, looking for a slight hint of optimism. And what that would do for, for UNRWA, for, um, for agencies and for program planning and, and implementation, if I could have perspectives from Gaza and if Simon wanted also to come back on that. I'm just. I'm going to repeat the the question for the virtue of Gaza because I've been told that it's actually this microphone that's <laughs> on the desk that's recording uh, directly for there. Um, so uh, Joe from Open Democracy was asking about uh, what a possible reconciliation between uh, Fatah and Hamas, uh, or no, not necessarily a reconciliation, but um, coordination or cooperation around a concrete humanitarian issue could mean for the the population of Gaza. Um, I think uh, I think th the people based in Gaza would, would be able to to enlighten you more about that. I, I know particularly UNRWA um, does deal with both those authorities and, and maybe has seen some of that cooperation in practice because it, it, it does happen, particularly around core needs of the population. Um, and I mean, I would just affirm that I think that's definitely a point that that both of those administrations can rally around is they both have an incentive to to address the needs of, of people who are affected by the conflict and I think see eye to eye to a certain degree on, on addressing those needs. Okay. D did you have? Could, could you go to, to Robert Sorry, perhaps to uh, to okay. uh, for their pr perspective from Gaza on, on the possibility of that? Robert? Gaza? Sorry, Sam, you're going to have to repeat. We can't hear anything from the audience. Okay. Um, do you want to... Repeat the last question. Hi, Robert. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Um, the question was around if there was scope for Fatah and Hamas to cooperate around a concrete humanitarian issue, and um, what scope that would have for improving the situation for people in Gaza. And um, I suppose I kind of added on a question to that, which was, have you seen any of that in practice in your programming? Okay. Um, I think. We can't look at this as a humanitarian issue in that sense. It, the, the issue in Gaza is not the delivery of humanitarian assistance. Uh, the issue in Gaza is why we have to deliver humanitarian assistance. And the reason is, is political. Um, so, I, I mean, if we maybe if I had an example of what kind of humanitarian issue we're talking about, but um, the, there aren't, there are not huge unmet humanitarian needs in the traditional sense. Um, their food insecurity is very high, but it's because of poverty. Poverty is because of, of unemployment. It's because of the blockade. Um, there's no famine. Uh, you know, there's no drought. There's, uh, it's not a production issue. It's not, a, it's not an issue of there not being goods in the shops. The issue is unemployment. So reconciliation between Hamas and Fatah would be a good thing. So it's a governance issue. So it's it's not a humanitarian issue as much as it is a governance issue. And therefore the relationship with Hamas and the political issues that I completely agree with you. And the rapprochement between Fatah and Hamas. Yeah, but I, I don't think that any of the political analysts would suggest that reconciliation between Fatah and Hamas is likely to get the blockade listed any faster. Uh, in fact, probably the opposite is true because uh, if, if Hamas became part of the, the PLO or the PA, that gives Israelis less uh, inclination to deal with them and, and to deal with political issues. So um, I think it's probably a necessary step politically, but I don't see, and I'm going to maybe differ with me, I, I don't see it's going to have any concrete 
change on the ground in Gaza. It, 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 it's not because the, the issues that uh, reconciliation could deal with are not the issues that are creating the poverty in Gaza. Okay, so, so Ahmed, you, you agree that that has no bearing on the situation, humanitarian situation. Whether Fatah, whether the division ends or not, that has no bearing. What we are talking about nowadays has been accumulated over years, maybe decades. So there would be no variation, definitely. I fully agree with uh, okay. Robert said. Okay. John, do you have a question? Tom Cowan from Open Democracy. I just wondered in um, the wake of the recent uh, elections in Israel, um, whether you, w what your thoughts were on the, the uh, climate, the political climate within Israel to lift the siege, um, both um, politically and in wider society. Because from, f from the elections, it would suggest that that, that that doesn't look possible. I know none of the pal panelists are actually uh, representing uh, the, the, Israel, the Israeli, Israelis. The Israeli but government. But, but do you think, th is there a possibility now with the... But the elections well have brought nothing new. It well, exactly, yeah. So... so, so but, but I guess there is a difference between the, cl the political climate of Israeli government and wider Israeli society and, uh, and uh, do you, do you their attitudes towards lifting the siege. And I, I just wondered if... Do you think at street level, Israelis lose sleep over this issue? Personally, I d no, I, d I don't. Uh, do, th do you there think was it's high on the priority of the voter? In no, I, I think the recent elections showed that their priorities were, were around um, the cost of living, exactly. housing. Exactly. And we saw the big um, protests in Tel Aviv a couple of years ago um, were, were demonstrative of I that. I but it, I just, we have to be talking about, w w when we're talking about political pressure in Israel, we have to understand, well, is there a political climate to withstand that pressure. If, if I may just say something on this, because on BBC Arabic television, I did a program recently about this very issue, and we conducted a little poll, and it turned out that there's, there isn't much interest, to be honest. Uh, we, we've asked them, do you care what happened in Gaza? Do you, are you interested? There, there isn't that much interest. Now, it wasn't a scientific poll, and you know it was just representing the opinions of those we've asked, but that's the impression that we had at BBC d during that particular program. So, uh, would, would you like, is there any- I'd be very interested in hearing what their insights are. Yeah, I don't know, um, can, can you hear, can you tell us if there's anything? Is do you detect any interest with the Israeli voters about this whole thing? You know, well I think the question about the government can't be answered because we don't know what the government's going to be, what the makeup's going to be. It's what no, the but, but fr be. from the point of view of voters, is there any? But the election was, the yeah. election was largely domestic, as they said. Yeah. I think yeah. the, the Palestine was very much a secondary or even third level issue. And that I think also, oh, the, Sarah, yeah, yes, yeah. please. Yeah, I mean, I don't, and not some directly connected to the elections, but if you look at um, the escalation in November, public opinion polls of, uh, of most Israelis did support the, the military operation, and there was actually. Um, enough majority support that would have for, that would have supported a ground incursion. So it is, I think, um, I mean, I think there is, when it comes to Gaza, the security line is the main line, and, and that's the line that most Israelis are, um, are behind. I mean, that, that, is going, that is going to be the one issue they think of with Gaza. Right. Well, I'm afraid we, we really have to leave it uh, here. This, I moderate quite a number of uh, discussions about involving Israel and the Palestinians. Normally people walk out and there is shouting. You guys have been <laughs> incredibly well behaved, so thank you very much. Thank you to our speakers, uh, Robert Turner, Sarah Adamsik, Ahmed Abu Tawahina, Rishnar Ali, and of course, Simon Haysen. Thank you all very much, and thank you for coming, for your engagement, for your questions. I'd like to remind you very quickly that the event uh, video and audio recording will be online within 48 hours. So thank you all very much.